Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've seen episode zero of Let's Learn StarCraft, because this is episode one, where we're going to kick it off with an analysis of Stork versus Fantasy from the Incruit OSL Finals in 2008. Now, StarCraft has a really unique aspect that many releases do not have, which is that on the first day of release, there's a lot of people who've been playing it for about 20 years. <laughs> so there are tons of incredible games and wonderful history that we get to tap into that we get to talk about as we're trying to learn and improve ourselves. And so the on-game net Star League is one of the most important things in the history of StarCraft 1, or as I will call it all the time, Brood War. The on-game net Star League was considered the number one league that you wanted to win to be legitimized as a, as a pro in South Korea. Because in South Korea, as many of you know, they had these extraordinarily large, well-funded, robust pro teams, televised matches every week with millions of watchers for each individual episode. I mean, it was a phenomenon there. And in each of these uh, on-game net finals, in each of these OSL finals, there was always in extraordinary preparation, very interesting strategies that were brought to the table because these players were trying to do everything they could to win these. There were only three on game net star leagues a year, one in the spring, one in the summer, and one in the fall. Uh, technically, there was no one in the winter because the seasons were actually like four months-ish long. And this particular one came at a very interesting time where Stork, our Protoss player, who you see here on the left, Stork was a legendary Protoss who had just never quite gotten first place. He'd gotten second a few times. And Fantasy kind of wound up in the same spot, although Fantasy did get his gold, of course. Fantasy, this player on the right, a legendary Terran player. Um, both of these players were extraordinarily good, but were one of those people that were kind of considered just below championship tier. They were the sort of people who you'd go, oh yeah, absolutely great players, but you wouldn't put them up there with Bisu or Jadong or Flash. And so this particular match, this particular finals, had a lot of weight going into it of who was going to come out on top. Each of these players has a relatively distinct play style when compared to the remainder of the uh, players in the pro scene. Stork on the left is a Protoss player who I can sum up as the Dragoon, okay? This guy is absolutely sturdy, stable, no-nonsense, plays very straightforward, does not try to do a lot of aggressive, cutesy plays very much. He's just solid. And at the time, a lot of people were losing their minds over Bisu, the fact that he was doing amazing things with Corsairs and DTs, or about Best, who would just have a billion zealots out of nowhere. Nope, Stork plays, in a lot of ways, an unremarkable style of Protoss leading up to this point. Fantasy, on the other hand, is the stark contrast to Flash at the time. Flash was a player who was known for taking lots of bases. Flash is like the tank Terran. He would play very defensively, get these huge armies that were unstoppable. But Fantasy, this player on the right, Fantasy is the kind of person who would be very aggressive with Vultures and was very much so the attacking Terran. And so it was going to be an interesting clash of styles going into this series. Now, for any of you who did not know, the on-game net Star League would always have five maps in the pool. And during finals matches, you would have the same map in games one and five. And of the remaining four maps, you'd have a different one in two, three, and four. This is the map that was their very first match. Let's go ahead and zoom in to the top side so we can uh, take a look a little bit at what a main base looks like. So you have a main here with some extra area here in which to build. And you come down this ramp and there's a natural expansion here. And this is great. But I want you to just look and ask yourself the question, where the hell do you go for a third base? Technically, you can like, I don't know, work your way up this little weird backdoor ramp up to this area and take this. Or you can kind of push all the way out into the middle of the map here and then like hook back around here. Oh my gosh, there are truly no good third bases on this map at all. And this is very different when you look at more modern maps like Circuit Breaker um, or Fighting Spirit, the, the canonical ultra neutral map that uh, pretty much everyone plays on right now. Not a lot of very easily accessible bases on Sin Pong Ryong. By the way, 
apologies to anyone who speaks Korean. I know I'm not pronouncing this shit well. <laughs> so, in this game, this back door entrance is something that's very important. These weird, tight corridors are something very important. And I want to give just one last bit of analysis before we hop into the game. This high ground and this middle area are very important to control. Imagine you're up at the top side, you're in teal, and you work your way down, and your opponent controls this. You now have to push up a high ground to attack your opponent. Your opponent is covering this base and this base, all the three outer bases very well. Well, what about this back door one? Well, technically you can go this way, but it's really tight corridoring. And if you devote too many resources here to defending this, they literally barrel down the middle. So this winds up being an extremely tense and difficult map to play a game on in the long term because it's just so damn cramped. And this is the first and fifth match. Uh, the first and fifth match map. So down here we have Stork in the bottom left. And up in the top right, we have Fantasy in the top right. What we're going to see out of Stork is something that is just... That is just classic. This is like classic first game in a best of five. He's going to send his very first probe out to do something potentially cheesy. Now, what did I say before this game began? Well, Stork is a player who for years established himself as the sturdy Protoss, as the guy who could win solid games, maybe not in the flashiest manner, but who was just overall good with macro, great, great, great with Dragoon control and positioning. And here he is building his first pylon on the other side of the map. This is the sort of thing that is very frightening. if you are a Terran player. Okay, so, Terran player goes out here, and you'll notice this is a little move that Flash, or excuse me, Fantasy does. He leaves this um, SCV here. He's played this map enough that he knows that these types of cheeses are invariably gonna happen at some point. He does a little bit of circling, and damn, he sees the probe coming out. He does the circling to see the angle of the scouting probe. And of course, this indicates to him very clearly that there is this sort of rush coming. What happens next from Fantasy can be described only as he got flustered. There are ways that you can construct your buildings so that Marines can pass through them, but Zealots cannot. And Fantasy does not do that. This is an example of very smart building placement to enable a strategy. You know what happens a lot of the time if a Protoss player does this? These five SCVs come out and just kill the pylon. And then, you know, the rush is over. Or they'll come out and they'll kill this gateway and the rush is over. But this gateway actually serves as a choke point. I don't think that anything can actually fit through here. And so this back, more important to kill off gateway, is unable to be touched. So here's the cancel. This is what's exceptional about the preparation of Stork here. Stork was never actually intending on doing two gate pressure. He wanted guaranteed one gate pressure with the second gate there to block. And Fantasy, very much so out of his element, doesn't build his barracks adjacent to his supply depot in some fashion that would allow him to micro against zealots through. He's already built a, a barracks over here, and it's too late. It's, it's bad to cancel this barracks and to try to rebuild it because there's a zealot coming i mean look at this the barracks isn't done yet the barracks not done yet and you know what stork's doing back home he actually has a pretty solid amount of probes he's getting his assimilator which is the next step in every protoss build he's going to get a cybernetics core tune or excuse me his cybernetics core soon and zealots walking through everything <laughs> This is, this is a painful moment where your Zealots just can walk freely through a Terran base. Because Zealots, these are not StarCraft 2 Zealots. These are StarCraft 1 Zealots, and they do not fuck around. You can just end an entire game with one Zealot. This is, this is not how you want to start a Finals appearance. No doubt Fantasy had a whole bunch of cool preparations, a bunch of interesting builds, a bunch of ways to exploit the terrain on this map. Is he going to get to do any of those? No. 
He's losing to Zealots, marching in one by one. And now we have... We have just three SCVs remaining. There's a Marine, and the other two in production constitute the seven supply for fantasy. And Stork's, uh, yeah, he's getting his second gateway down. Hey, what's over here? Oh, oh, he could actually probably start making a Dragoon. Now, because Stork is brilliant, this is like possibly the best move in the entire game. Stork's like, you know what? I'm just gonna kill him with probes. Okay, okay, let's just, let's just take a moment, okay? Okay, he's gonna kill him with probes in the finals of the on-game net Star League, the most important tournament in the history of Brood War. Good on you. That's awesome. Here he goes. Here he goes. Oh, man. Oh, no. Choo-choo. Okay. Fantasy is gonna try his best. Fantasy Micro basically as good as he could. But then the probes come. Wow, what a great way to disorient your opponent in the Grand Finals. And the probes actually do a non-trivial amount of damage in order to help this Dragoon edge out in this fight. Uh, by the way, Fantasy did say GG. Th these games have been scrubbed of all uh, speech. So it's not like he was just like, Rah! just exploded and, and didn't uh, <laughs> say GG. But, I mean, that's the sort of thing that really goes to show how important very precise preparation is from Stork, the ability to set up that really nice build that walled off with the gateway. And it also shows what happens when you get flustered and mess up about one small thing. I mean, it's really just the one. If you build a barracks and a supply depot in a very specific way, Marines can run through, but Zealots can't. So you run through and shoot from the other side. He comes this way, you run back through and shoot from that other side. So Stork leads 1-0 in this series. This brings us to the second map, which is Medusa, which is a map that um, I actually quite like. I don't know why I should like this map. It's really obnoxious to play as Zerg, but, you know, you wind up, if you're a StarCraft player, with a habit of just going, I really want to learn how to win on this thing. And then after a while, you just develop comfort uh, with things that are uncomfortable. Let's take a look at this position here, right? Let's assume that we're red. There's three positions here, uh, here at the three o'clock position, here at the 11 o'clock position, and then down here at the seven o'clock position. Now, if we take a look here, there are some typical characteristics of modern maps. There is an expansion that is relatively easy to take, right? No problem. There are extra expansions that are coming off from the middle of the map. There is a big open central area where big fights can occur. Um, a lot of maps that you'll see in the last two, three, four years don't quite have such big open maps. There's often like, you know, a big cavern in the middle, so it winds up being a little more circular. But during this era, big wide open centers were standard. There's also a back door mineral only expansion that has no gas. But the thing that's really notably weird and you'll kind of see this emerge in Fantasy's gameplay here. Right here on the map, if we zoom in, right here there are neutral buildings that are blocking a ramp to allow you backdoor access here. And if you do break through this, you can imagine as Terran, Vulture is walking up here, or if you're Protoss, you can imagine sending a Dark Templar back here and killing off stuff here, on maybe getting into the main. You can also imagine as Terran getting in here and sieging up right here and shooting down at any buildings or here. This is kind of a weird, funky thing. And I saw this asked in chat. Yes, if you are shooting from low ground to high ground, you miss 50% of the time. So basically you have more health if you're on the high ground. So. This is the type of formation that you just have to be considerate of. And there's a couple of approaches that you might take in Brood War. One of them might be, I am going to do something I'm already comfortable with and just try to defend this a lot. If you are an attacker's or a, an attacking player, as Fantasy is, Fantasy says, what can I do in order to exploit this? There's one other thing that I just want to emphasize before we get into the game. This entrance is very wide open. Often there are tighter chokes here, 
or a ramp here at the entrance, it's pretty open in both of these places. And for that reason, there's a lot of caution that needs to be taken in the early game. And if you are... And mission, exit the replay. If you are fantasy, you're going to be kind of thinking, Oh, God, I really don't want to lose to a stupid cheese again. Let's go into game two of this matchup. Um, it's going to be on Medusa with Stork spawning in the top right position here. And with Fantasy spawning in the purple trunks down here at the bottom. And something that's actually kind of funny um, about um, StarCraft maps is that StarCraft maps are not even in terms of all their aspects. Some of the starting positions have more airspace that they can get dropped from. Some of them have a smaller choke at the entrance. There's tons and tons and tons and tons of differences in every single position. And if you talk to StarCraft II players, very often maps are designed to be absolutely 100% symmetric in every single position. Uh, and that's just not the case when it comes to Brood War. And it's interesting to see those sort of different philosophies from the communities sort of emerge. Because, you know, in StarCraft, you're just like, oh, this is what I'm working with. All right, okay, this is what I got. And cool things can emerge as a result of it, because for every two weird deficiencies you have, he also has two weird deficiencies. Like right here. This gas geyser is far away from these minerals. Therefore, if I want to protect these, I can't do it with just, say, one cannon or one spore colony or one turret. Over here, you can. You can build one cannon here, and it basically defends everything. Okay, so what's the current state of the game in this mode? Well, Stork has already done this very interesting and aggressive cheese strategy that just got him a very, very easy win. See, there's there. There's some good positioning right there is where you can do some nice work. Um, and we're going to see a second type of preparation that Stork is going to do for future games. Remember, game one, after you wind up doing this really weird cheese, Fantasy's got to be going, oh god, I hope I don't get cheesed again. He might do something like scout his back natural, or he might be just okay with the formations that he has in his main base. Um, but the thing that Stork is going to do in this game, and in many of the games coming up, is he's just going to start right off with a zealot. Now, in terms of just general build orderage, this Zealot does delay your probe production a little bit. You have to be a little bit thoughtful about uh, holding on and not building a probe, so that way you can build this pylon in time. And then you'll see that very nicely this Cybernetics Core and this pylon line up so that he's not supply blocked. These are the little tiny optimizations that if you've played the game for a decade, you look for. You look for ways to get everything lined up just right. Oh, I'm going to cancel one probe for 15 seconds, so boom, boom, build these, and now it's started. So in a sense, this Zealot gets snuck out, and this Dragoon does not get any sort of delay added onto it. Now in Fantasy's base, he's doing super duper ultra basic stuff. He's going for barracks that's building some marines at the start. He's going for a factory that will allow him to build mechanical units because tank vulture really is the composition in this matchup. And zealot dragoon is the composition for Protoss. And with a lot of the time, you don't need that much gas if you just are using one factory. So you pull one SCV out of gas, reducing all of your gas income by a third. And this lets you get just a few extra minerals, so that way you can toss down an expansion. Well, you can always toss down the expansion, but you can toss it down a little bit more quickly. He's actually going to get this probe. Oh, that just sucks. Now, what we're going to see out of here that... We're going to see this out of fantasy that I'm going to say all the time. Watch how fantasy defends this calmly. Calmly. Okay? He doesn't rip all his SCVs off the line. See, he, he runs down this way and then runs up. Notice how this zealot cannot get through this. Notice how no SCVs were pulled. Notice how a zealot is way the fuck better than two marines. 
A zealot will beat a marine so easily. It will beat two marines so easily. But thanks to this little gateway for just marines, he defends it calmly. Calmly, calmly, and thoughtfully. He's not running forward to try to get lucky pickoffs. He's just sitting here, calm as can be. Right, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? This is Medusa is the name of the map, Denunciator. Medusa. Or excuse me. That was Dogumon who asked that in chat. And look at this. It gets defended excellently. Like, yeah, you're going to try to hang here if you're Protoss and just kind of be like, yeah, I'm in your face, you see? Yeah. But I mean, the Terran's fine. Now, what is interesting that Stork is doing with this bit of early pressure? Well, first of all, it exists because there is no good ramp here. But on the back side, Stork is hiding a pylon. Now, if you are um, fantasy, you're going to note one, two, three pylons in the main base. So, unless fantasy rescouts again and sees, oh, there's no fourth pylon, fantasy is likely not going to know that there is a hidden pylon. This is something that very good players will do, is they will count buildings in order to... Uh, identify what possible threats are coming. If there's only two pylons, it means there has to be a third one hidden, and so on and so forth. Now, if you're a new player, you know what you do? You do a safe build. You just play it really, really, really safely. So fantasy gets in. So if you're fantasy, you might suspect something. All right, I'm going to speed things up a little bit because at this point, fantasy builds two tanks. He is not getting siege mode. He is just getting the tanks for sturdiness and then getting a command center. He's skipping siege mode because he wants to just do other preparations a little faster. Now, we're about five minutes into the game. This is a big uh, big moment in the game, I guess I'd say, because this aggression has sort of calmed down. We see no expansion yet. We see a hidden citadel of a dune, which almost always is Dark Templar. We have a fantasy who currently, if we actually just look at his vision has no idea, he has not even scouted this area of the map. So what do you do? What do you do? If you're a new player, you're just you're just gonna play safely. Like if you're a new player, just get an engineering bay. Just get an academy. Just get some stuff. I would recommend both. So that way you can build turrets against Reavers, so you can have extra scans to see what he's doing to detect Dark Templar and to prepare for a later push, and I'd play it safe, damn it. That's not fantasy, okay? That's not fantasy. That's not fantasy. Alright, let's speed things up. Why is Siege Mode getting skipped? Well, it's expensive. And Fantasy first wants to build extra factories because he's going to get aggressive. Stork. What's Stork doing? Well, Fantasy hasn't really seen anything. He's going to send over a floating barracks. But if you're Fantasy, you're, you're going to kind of smell that something's up, right? You scouted in this base. You saw a late robotics facility. You saw a robotics facility before you saw an expansion. You saw some pressure early on, but nothing that big. So, gosh, something's up. Now... This type of timing push is hard as hell to find unless you are an absolute pro. This is an interesting technique that a lot of people will do. By the way, Templar Archives is done from the Hidden Citadel of Adun. Two DTs with a shuttle almost out. Now, if you if you talk to Artosis, if you talk to Artosis, he hates this build. He hates this build so much. He just have Dark Templar that are invisible, you drop them. If there's a scan, you lift them back up, right? It's really annoying, so. <laughs> oh, God. So. This type of push, or excuse me, this type of play from Stork is a big stepping stone moment. What you typically do is a play, like try to drop this and deal damage, and then you're going to get your expansion behind that. That's kind of how the early game works. You do one play, maybe two, and it's just a kind of secure basis. Maybe you'll kill your opponent, but it doesn't have to do that. So look at the angle of this. Stork wants to send this straight over to Fantasy's base, but Fantasy, who is only just now finishing mines, now has three factories done. He doesn't have any detection yet, though. This, this entire sequence is very impressive to me from Fantasy. 
So here's here's the barracks. Let's first look at the fight, and we're going to return back to this barracks, okay? Just keep that barracks in mind. Some shots go off. Remember how we were talking about five dragoons? Five dragoons narrowly edged out some marines, one vulture, and one tank. Therefore, four tanks, two vultures, and some marines will easily kill these five dragoons. But of course, Dark Templar are invisible. So they're just dealing huge damage, pushing everything back. We have some obnoxious ass mines here. Oh, yep, he's not Bisu, so it's all right. Sequence is very impressive to me because throughout all of that, Fan Fantasy didn't really lose. I think he only lost one tank during that entire exchange. He has many tanks left over. But this bought him enough time to get up this missile turret. This is in many ways why attacking um, has slowly, slowly become the norm in Brood War. And why there's so many builds that have aggressive openings or attacks planned into them. Because it allows you to do stuff like this. So, he's trying to trigger the mines. I, I think he actually successfully did it, yeah. Uh, Dark Templar stays alive. Dark Templar only have 120 health, so they're easy to kill. The entire cost of this drop for fantasy was a depot. No SCVs killed. He's going to get his academy up. He's still churning out hard. Remember Mr. Barracks? Mr. Barracks sees that the Nexus isn't even done. This is something that happens a lot if you're playing StarCraft, especially if you're hopping into it. You imagine that your opponent is doing everything. If your opponent is being really aggressive up in your face and he's dropping you a lot, he cannot possibly have a good economy behind him. If you're going economically focused and he's going attack focused, he definitely has more units and more tech. You definitely have more money. So don't don't freak out. You're, you're doing great. You're doing great. And so this very, very late, I mean, this is getting done at like almost eight minutes. If you're in Fantasy's shoes, you're going, oh man, I might be ahead economically. But there's something that I want to know. Outside of this back door entrance, it's very hard for Terran to get a third gas geyser. So I just want you to keep that in mind, because Fantasy is going to be getting into attacking mode soon. Boy, that's a lot of mines. But this is actually okay, because it protects from other drops and whatnot. Notice how Stork is just being so thoughtful with all of these Dark Templar. He's just not trying to do anything fancy. He's trying to pick off Supply Depots, one of the most unexciting targets in all of StarCraft. But that's no problem, right? Because he's getting some extra money. Yeah, he can be seen by this missile turret. But he's just calmly trying to load up, delay this as much as possible. Great. Hey, there's Siege Mode finishing super late. So if you're in Stork's shoes, the pressure is really on. Because you are behind on your expansions. Generally, it, it, in this matchup, Protoss wants to have about, uh, I'd say, 3 to 2 in terms of my expansion count to the Terran expansion count. Protoss always wants to be ahead in terms of expansion. In fact, a 3 base Terran probably needs a 5 or 6 base Protoss in terms of just sheer volume of stuff for the Protoss to be able to win. So here, Protoss is a little bit on the back foot. Stork eh, is feeling a little concerned. Now, what I love so much about Stork is that he's just amazing with his Dragoons. And here is the deciding sequence of the game. Fantasy is going to siege up here and just begin to pick off this neutral building. He's gonna use all these vultures to build extra mines. And in classic fantasy fashion, he only has one building making tanks. Everything else is vultures. Stork is doing what he can. Holding off what he can. And what's going to happen is that these tanks are going to get up on the high ground and begin picking this off. This is what makes fantasy so fun to watch. Is that he is always looking for attacks. He is just the most attacky, focused Terran. I love watching him. Uh, but he's not just like mindlessly aggressive. He has beautiful timings with his build orders. You'll, you'll notice that Fantasy is not just running vultures around trying to pick off probes willy-nilly. He's not that sort of proto, or excuse me, that sort of Terran. He's very carefully constructing this push. Does some exploration, 
but it is part of the push. Now, what we're going to see out of Stork is sheer calm. He's going to use these Dragoons just in amazing ways. All right, just wait. He's just waiting. He's just chilling. He's just hanging out. <laughs> Zealot Leg Speed has just been started, man. <laughs> Zealot Leg Speed has just been started. Stork is so behind on his stuff, given the way that a normal Protoss should look. If you were asking me who do I think has an advantage, I would give a little bit of an edge to Fantasy. He has been messed with some, but this is a very scary mixture to deal with. He doesn't even have gas at this expansion. We're actually going to switch the view to just Stork for a moment. Look at these observers seeing everything. And you know what they're going to do? Shoot anything. Just get little extra edges here and there. Look at that. Tanks and units being drawn this way. Anytime something gets drawn this way, that's great. It's not stuff happening up here. Battles in StarCraft 1 tend to be long sequences. Long sequences. With lots of buildup. And notice, as he sees things brought down here to the bottom, he's going to send a zealot here as part of another step in the sequence just... to eat some mine shots. Has just a ring of vision around this, so he sees everything that is going on. And this is very intimidating, right? He's gonna be possibly losing gateways here. And through just the careful picking off of these Dragoons, notice the Dragoons are coming at a point. See how the tanks, you can almost view them as a line that starts here and ends here, right? If we just view it as this line. He's attacking the point of the line. And there's just no more mines. Fantasy has just slowly lost mines little by little and with basically no zealots in this force. Certainly zero speed zealots. Stork is able to calmly pick off mines and then just walk right up to the tanks. Here's some more slow zealots. That are actually remarkably slow. What a treat, man. What a treat that defense was to watch. Just super chill. And part of the reason that I'm so impressed with this is that, like, fantasy, when these when these little plays that fantasy does, if they do not have a player carefully picking off these mines here, and oh look, there's an SCV, let me get that, oh, I've picked off two extra vultures, in the way that Stork did. They get stomped, dude! Fantasy has some of the most one-sided games in the history of StarCraft, in the early game. You'll, yeah, you'll see Flash do a max Terran push, and he'll win at like 15 minutes, and you're just like, wow, well, that's just amazing. Yeah, I guess there's no way you can beat a Terran player who's 2-1 and max at 15 minutes. But, I mean, Fantasy's the sort of guy who would just, like, smash Bisu in, like, six minutes. <laughs> You'd just be like, <gasps> Actually, six minutes is a little fast. I'm thinking more of my StarCraft II time frame. But he would just, like, smash Bisu in, like, eight minutes or nine minutes. We're even going to see more of Awesome Fantasy throughout this whole series. But this is kind of what makes Stork, in many ways, appear less remarkable. Because he doesn't do a big flashy moment and another big flashy moment. He is the master of accumulating tiny efficiencies, particularly with the Dragoon. And so many players shy away from even exploring these types of styles that Fantasy is doing. Because it feels really bad. Right now, you only have one factory with an add-on. Just this one. Everything else was devoted to Vultures. You do not have a second gas. There is no armory. Terran has zero, zero upgrades. Through all this... Protoss also doesn't have any upgrades, but Protoss is a little bit farther down the tech line with the Forge and with the Templar Archives. Zealots are terrible in small numbers, by the way. You really need, like, 20 of them to feel scary and shit. So this is also very classic. Every Terran. Anytime a Terran who went for a Vulture-heavy push, anytime they lose that push, they're just like, Well, I hope I kill probes! And they just, like, march the Vultures in. Ah! I do like the way that Fantasy's doing this, though, because he is just sending three. He's not trying to send, like, 15 in to do something gigantic. He's just trying to pull Stork around, and Fantasy's just still 
really kind of focused on getting control of this little high ground thing. Which is great, but I, I think the numbers right now are a little high for Stork. I am actually very surprised that those mines didn't go off and kill everything, but, you know. The column of Stork. So this is, this is now a bad position to be in as fantasy. And, again, why a lot of people steer clear from fantasy-style builds is that this feels bad. This feels bad. But remember, our goal is not to avoid things that feel bad or necessarily to make ourselves feel good. We want to do stuff that actually wins games. And so, even though Fantasy might now lose this, he set himself up to be in a good position to maybe win the game. This is where I love watching good Protosses play. Not for the big flashy moves, but for how they close games out. Look at this. Remember the ring of observers in the middle of the map? Suddenly, it's becoming a ring of observers around the Terran base. Sees absolutely all the movement. Extra Dragoons up here to do spotting. Teching towards Arbiters. And now, finally, Protoss has some comfort to be able to take an extra base. If you watch modern Protoss vs. Uh, Terran, you're going to see just so many bases go down so fast. And a lot of that is because there are safe bases to take. On Medusa, if we just zoom way the hell out and reveal the whole map, if you want to defend this base, the one thing you need to defend is this bridge, and the only way to do that is to have full control over the middle of the map. That's it. That's the only way to do it. So you're not going to rush for that, right? Because you don't have any cute terrain or a little wall-off you can do. You have to put, put like 12 Dragoons there, man. That's how he's able to hold it off. So a lot of these games that wind up happening in the 2003 to 2010 period don't quite have as high base count as some of the more modern games. There's a lot more interesting tactics and a lot more prolonged battles that you see. So now Fantasy is just rebuilding to hopefully get another sturdy push going on, but as we can see, it's 160 supply for Protoss. And you know what's happening in the meantime? Storks, he's just literally building out of a lot of gates and chilling, man. Getting an expansion, chilling. These Dragoons are death squads. They're just sweeping the map. Why are they constantly moving? So Fantasy is not allowed to have any vision or any control over anything in this map. That's Fantasy's vision. Is like this mine, and this one, and these. Oh, look at the vultures, nice. Doesn't this just look horrible? Doesn't it just look terrible? Doesn't this just feel bad? This is another thing that I love about Stork. You really don't see Storm Drops super frequently in this matchup. You see them, absolutely, but you don't see them when there's a Protoss who's just now getting his third gas. This is something I have watched Stork do for years and years and years, where if he does not have a lot of bases, he gets shuttles with storms quite early in this matchup because it's just such a high value way to gain a tiny edge when no one really has that much economy. Not necessarily to just kill off SCVs, but also just to do drops on smaller numbers of tanks, which is pretty much the situation that Fantasy's in. He has, he has like 12. Certainly a scary number of tanks, but it's not like, you know, two control groups by any means. And just consistent macro on the back, the Dragoons trying to zone it out. Oh my god, the vision of Stork. Oh, so lovely. More storming. Oh, so great. And look at this, he's just carefully checking expansions, making sure there's nothing bad going on. And Stork is just in starvation mode. He's just waiting for this Terran player to move out so he can starve him. Or excuse me, he's trying to contain the Terran from getting extra expansions, so he'll eventually force the Terran player to move out. So here we go. Sends the Dragoons in, in the middle. The Zealots are coming in from the sides and coming in from behind. Dragoons lead the fight. Arbiter here. Typically, you see Arbiters used a lot in modern Protoss vs. Terran. Not as much 
when we're looking at these games that are very low base count, because there's not a lot of opportunity to do recall, but they are great for stasis. And literally with sh with just macro. Just with all those defenses. Not blankets of storm overrunning everything. Just two. A single stasis. The zealots eventually get eaten up. But Stork, the king of the goons, wins again. And the GG's called. And Stork leads the series 2-0. Let's take a moment to note that this game, this is the first game where I feel like you really get the opportunity to see the styles of these two players baking out. You really got the chance to see that Fantasy loves his tactical play, loves his aggressive vulture pushes. You got to see how Stork uses his Dragoons and his Observers, just picking things off a little bit at a time, just chipping away at large armies uh, for Fantasy before eventually closing in. We really got to see that highlighted in a clear way there. Um, and it's so amazing to think about that game in contrast to game one. Where game one, Stork, like, proxy gatewayed. That's, like, not what Stork does. And so this means that currently, with his life on the line, we have... Oops, i got to open up the map. We now have Stork leading 2-0. What's fantasy to do? This map is a very interesting one to be in this position on because, it, let, let me explain. Let me explain when you look at the map, okay? Let me explain, okay? This is, this is Return of the King is the name of this map. This is probably the most traditional map that we have seen, the most classic, neutral looking map that we've seen yet. You have an expansion here. Um, an expansion, or excuse me, a starting position in each of the corners, right? And it has, again, high ground with a ramp, and then you have a natural expansion. And guess what? You have a third that also has gas. And here's something crazy. In the top right, there's actually a teensy island expansion that you can expand to. It only has minerals, but cool, it's just a little bit of extra resources. So if you're up here, you're like, oh, hey, cool. I have three gas all to myself, and if I'm uh, Terran, that makes me very, very happy. I even have a little extra minerals there. If I'm Terran, that makes me very, very happy. And there's no other expansions on the map that are not part of a main. So we'll come back to the middle in a moment, but if you just glance around, oh yeah, up, you know, if I'm in the top right and I want to expand, I'm going to have to go to the top left's set of expansion. What's weird, though, is how the middle connects to everything. If you look at Fighting Spirit, all the main bases and some of the expansions are on high ground, and all the rest of the map is on low ground. So pushing into those expansions is kind of tough, but when you're battling in that low ground area, we're on even footing. This is fucking weird. This is really, really weird, because you have to exit your base by going up a high ground, and then there's this kind of narrow high ground ring around here and then you go up and there's an even higher ground up in the center of the map so you sort of go from the lowest to the middle to the highest and then back down right away this says that if you are doing big aggressive pushes in the middle of the game you have an advantage because if you're in the middle and you're the one attacking first you're going downhill downhill and in Plus, like, like, what is what is this? What is this gross area? Oh, it's disgusting. This this small valley. Why is it gross? Oh, I'm imagining tanks like right there. Oh, 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 Jesus. Oh, God. Tanks are just gonna murder anything that walks through there. But if you do look at this map, you might say something like, you know, oh, if I'm Protoss and I'm up here. I'm going to take my expansion, and I'm just going to try to hold this area out here, and I'm going to make the Terran push up to me. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That's my play right there. The thing that's a little, I guess, weird to me. I guess weird. There's The only way I can describe it is weird. What's so weird about this is that fantasy is down 0 and 2. And if you're down 0 and 2, like, imagine you're playing any game, 
I don't care if it's Dota or Hearthstone or StarCraft, if someone says to you, you need to win this game, you're probably going to do something that you think is safe and comfortable. Those are like the two keywords that you're going to be weighing against each other. Safe and comfortable. How do I merge these together? So like if I'm Zerg, yeah, in game one I might five pool. I might just do some sort of cheesy bullshit rush. But if I'm down 0-2, yep, I'm going to expand. I'm going to get Mutalisks. I will then get Lurkers and Defilers because I'm the most normal Zerg in the world. Let's look at a little bit of what happens on this particular map. If we zoom in to one of these tactical positions right here. Our Protoss hero, Stork, is going to be up in this corner. And imagine if you are Fantasy. Look at just if you had mines and tanks here. Protoss is pretty dead, right? Where does Protoss expand? Well, certainly not up here. Maybe Protoss is just locked back into this island, but if Protoss wants any expansion anywhere else, Protoss has to break through this area. Keep that in your brain. Keep that in your mind as we head into this next game, where Fantasy is going to do some just real wondrous stuff in this game. Is, this is just going to be amazing. So we have Stork up in the top right. Indeed, I didn't lie to you. I'm correct. He's up here in the top right. Down here in the bottom right, we got Storkaroni in the Pepperoni. Oh my god, no we don't. We have Fantasy. Guys, I lied to you. I'm so sorry that I'm a liar. Okay, so if I am Fantasy, I am going to be thinking of ways that I can turtle. I'm going to be thinking of ways that I can take this extra gas expansion here. I'm going to be thinking of ways that I can lift a command center and get a drop ship to remove this mineral or a dropship with an SCV, so the SCV can remove this mineral field so I can expand here and mine from this. These are the kinds of things that I would want to look for because I would say, let's just make a game go on nice and long and safe. In terms of Stork, we talked a lot about preparation. We talked a lot about the way that one build and one opening on one map might psych you out for the next one. Notice how he once again, builds that first Zealot. You'll recall in the last game on Medusa, Stork did this. Built a Zealot, and what did he do with it? He did an early attack. If you're Fantasy and you scout an early Zealot, you now know it could be an early attack. But, what we're going to see out of Stork is that he instead takes his first 200 minerals and 200 gas and builds a robotics facility. Only after that, does he actually wind up getting a Dragoon out? Fantasy is being unbelievably normal right now. He's being the most normal Terran player humanly possible. He is getting a factory that will later get tanks. He has a few Marines lurking out and about. He is getting another command center constructed. By not building extra Marines, by having a reduced Marine count, this command center comes down very, very early. Very small tunings to your economy can have extraordinarily large impacts in how your build plays out. Oh, the factory's not even done with its add-on yet. It's crazy fast. And when it is done, I just love this. Look at it. It's just about ready to be able to build a tank. And this is something that is characteristic of Fantasy's early openings. It's these really precise timings. Like, when I would look at this, my intuition would tell me, wow! Maybe you messed up your build somewhere because you just don't quite have enough to build that factory. Or don't quite have enough to build that tank out of that factory. And he says, yeah, you know what? I'm actually going to cut SCVs for a moment. And then I'm going to wait for this supply depot to build. And now I'm going to be getting mines. And you're noticing that all of his money everywhere is staying quite low. So that's just sort of a, a nuanced appreciation of his timings lining up just so. Um, that allows this command center to come down crazy, crazy early. It's not even uh, five minutes yet, and it's halfway. It's actually a little over four minutes. It's halfway done. I want to come back to this strategic layer, though, outside of the base management uh, mini game. We're going to see a classic opening in ultra fast reaver drop. Why an ultra fast reaver drop? 
everyone forget the series for a moment and appreciate the idea of a long-term game plan with a short-term move. Long-term, I'm Protoss, I want this damn island. You know what? I might even want it a little early in the game as part of my strategy. Therefore, if I go for a Reaver Drop, a Reaver Drop is in itself good, and it opens up the opportunity for me to toss this pro over here. Imagine for a moment if you were a Protoss player that went for a ranged Dragoon and expand opening and then needed to build some observers and then right when you'd want to take that third you'd have to start a shuttle and then load a probe into it and then take that down. That would basically be the earliest point in time that you could even dream of taking that top right expansion. But here Stork is able to get that up very very quickly. Fantasy is getting very usual things. Mines, mines are insane. I, I mean, like, listen, this is not going to be a balanced conversation, but Vultures are the best unit in the game. It's either the Vulture or the Zergling is far and away the best unit in the game. Protoss definitely doesn't have any best units in the game, man. That is crazy, silly good. So anyways, um, Fantasy, I love what he's doing here. He, he has essentially no information. So what does he do? Well, he got an ultra-fast command center, so he's feeling pretty positive about his status economically. So dude, he just builds an engineering bay. Look at that, he's just, he's just building an engineering bay. Putting some mines around. This is great. Oh, look at this, building another missile turret. Built this before he even saw the shuttle. It's so good, it's so good. Let me slow this game down just a teensy bit. So, I want to come back to what I was talking about in the introductory episode. In the introductory episode, I was talking about the idea that you can use control or micro to solve some problems that otherwise you might be using in-game money to solve. So, an example is these missile turrets are spending in-game money and resources to deflect this reaver and shuttle but it's never going to be able to cover everything so watch what fantasy does when stork unloads these units first he's going to aim here now i can click on the scarab and you'll note that it does 100 damage so if the scarab connects we should see that the health will be around 50. but instead by moving away from the explosion, it doesn't take full damage from the center of the explosion. It takes reduced damage from one of the outer rings of the Scarab explosion. Because things kind of do a lot in the middle, less out, even less out, right? That's kind of like the... That's why Archons do a lot of damage to the target Zergling and then do a little bit of tiny splash around there. So by moving away, look at this. This tank that's taking a direct hit is only taking 50 damage because the full damage is 100 and half damage is 50. And this is just a brilliant identification. This is a brilliant identification from Fantasy. Yes, the Reaver is a big threat, but yeah, let's just kill some free Zealots. Look at this. If, you're, if you are up against a reaver drop, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be able to pull this off. Like, I cannot pull this off because I go completely, insanely tunnel visioned on, oh my god, reaver, 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 reaver. See, I shoot there, but look at this. Fantasy stops. He changes his targets to the zealots. And he literally, he just ignores the shuttle. He just keeps running away and taking free pot shots on these. Runs right back. He did take full damage from that. That's for damn sir. Picks it off, doesn't lose the tank. Keeps both of his tanks alive. Barely. But he got a Reaver. That that sucks for Stork. That's bad. That's like the whole point of his opening. And Stork's just like, oh my, I'm really embarrassed. You know, I'm just going to build another Reaver. Oh gosh. Oh goodness. So let's ask ourselves a question. What do you do now as Stork? What do you do now as Fantasy? Well... In Stork's shoes, if you didn't go for Reaver, typically what you would wind up doing is you would go straight for Zealot Leg Speed, and you would have a large Zealot Dragoon army in order to hold off whatever the Terran player was doing. But if you do go for the Reaver, you've kind of delayed building a bunch of stuff. 
In other words, reavers really kind of are essential for staying alive if you do this opening. So you kind of have to build this reaver again if you are Protoss. And we're seeing, again, Stork is going to try to do some... Oh, look at it. Classical 3 Dragoon Micro. I seem to think that there is an Observer here. Do you guys see this ripple here? Oh, it's right there. Yeah, sorry, this is a bug. Yeah, so there, there, there's an Observer here. I knew I saw something. Okay, there's an Observer right here. I don't know why it's not showing up. What if I go to just Stork's Vision? Oh, this is interesting. Blizzard! I found a bug! Blizzard! Blizzard! There's an Observer right there! I saw the ripple, man. Oh my god, his observing skills are so sick. Oh, I saw the ripple. Oh my god. Uh. <laughs> okay, so anyways. At this moment in time, Stork is going to just get this Reaver. He's going to make sure that he has enough defense. He's going to try to use his Dragoon Sweeping. We just saw that in the last game. We just saw that in the last game. He's going to just try to do it again. Fantasies, once again, doing this very aggressively. He only has two factories. He's going to do this very aggressive play where he tries to push out. Because, remember what we talked about in our map analysis? If you hold this, you can shit on Protoss forever. Okay, and there's an observer right here, is it? There it is, yeah. Watch the way that fantasy does this. This is the tactical brilliance of fantasy. So first of all, fantasy notes, there is actually a little bit of a choke here. In fact, all of this is kind of a one-way path. Can Protoss actually go this way and then come around and then hit this from behind? Yeah, but it's long long. Now, I just want to also point out another thing about this don't worry about it, you're doing fine. Fantasy is whiffing SCV production. He has idle workers here. Stork got supply block just a second ago. Happens to everyone, man. Happens to absolutely everyone. Alright, we have some scouting buildings, but watch this. Okay. Mines and vultures. And soon enough, Fantasy is going to land this engineering bay in barracks and make a wall. Oh, he's going to land these and make a wall, dude. But being the scrappy Terran that he is, Fantasy is just trying to find ways to pick off Dragoons. And of course, Stork is, is equally just trying to pick off reinforcements. And this, I think, is a very clever angle that we're going to see out of Stork. By the way, that vulture kill right now, th this is Hallmark Stork. Just picking off a vulture here, picking off a vulture there. You don't even wince if you're fantasy. You're like, ah, whatever, man. I got three factories making vultures, man. I'm going to go up to five. I'm going to churn out all the vultures. It's fine to lose one. This is how Stork wins games. But Stork is trying to force the engagement away from that awful choke. This is a much more open area. But Fantasy, again, with the brilliant timing on managing his tank shots, manages to pick off this Reaver. And although... Hey, I can see the Observer now. Look at that. Although Fantasy did lose all the stuff, he's just locked in on this position. He's built a bunker. There's no Marines. And there's just more tanks and vultures getting rallied. One mine hit is basically all fantasy needs to stabilize. And he got it. This is the sort of fight that just looks and feels so weird if you're fantasy. <sighs> oh, shit. Whoops. Because you have, like, a mixture of no units or... Four units in a position. And I'll tell you right now, the game is over. Stork is dead. There is nothing he can do. Stork is going to be making as best of, as he can, unit-wise. But Fantasy did it. He has this engineering bay. Having floating engineering bays is a very common way to get extra vision for your tanks so that they can shoot at their full range. Fantasy is amazingly finding time to send in this harassing vulture here. Amazingly finding time to send in one more harassing vulture here. 
and the tank count stands at one. There is one tank. And you know, fantasy is building tanks one at a time. Everything else is vultures. Protoss is dead, man. Protoss is dead as shit. This is over. This is over. And it was all because of fantasy's clever timing, planning, and of course great micro during all these fights, centered around one thing. This is a good position. This is a good position. Now there's something that I want to just note as we're watching the life slowly drain out of Stork. Oh god, I think he like lands this here at some point. It's just, oh my god, I just want to vomit because it's just so good. It's so brutal. There's only that I kind of want to note. There's, um, in many other RTS games, let's just pick an RTS at random. In StarCraft 2, there's this thing that happens where, um, often two players will be neck and neck. And, like, you know, if you imagine graphs of their army sizes, they're, they're sort of, like, both evenly going up. And then a moment happens where there's a difference between them. And this player who's above has won. This player who's below has lost. They're sort of like, we're even, we're even, we're even. And it's just, like, like, broken into two. And that's the end of the game. And you'd look and you'd be like, that's the moment. That's the moment where that guy ran out of stuff. Brood War does not really operate that way. It's sort of like, all right, so he gets an advantage, but then another fight happened, and then another fight happened, and then we had another engagement, and then I picked off a vulture, and there's lots of tiny compounding things. So, for instance, if you ask me the question in this spot, what should Stork have really done differently? Well, he's still doing a lot of small things that will help him maybe be able to pull off a win, like doing stuff with his Reavers. Not losing the first Reaver was probably a big one, but there were like maybe 20 moments during this fight where one or two things could have gone a little differently, and he would have had a slightly more favorable engagement, and Fantasy would have been slightly delayed here, which maybe would have bought enough time to get more units. Brood War is the compounding of lots of smaller moments, much less the one big fight where my entire army died and that was it. Speaking of the entire army dying and that's it, oh my god, I, I blew right past that. Whoopsie, doopsie, damn daisies. Yep, rebuild the replay, I love that I can do that. Alright, let's watch this. Let's watch this in glorious slow motion, huh? Look at these mines. Oh. Oh my gosh, the meat grinder. <laughs> hey, this is a good position. How many tanks are there? I think there were four at the start of that. That's just good positioning and the beauty of Ultras, man. And you know what we see out of Fantasy? He is not moving any tanks down to the low ground. He's just waiting for the back ones to rally in not even expanding anywhere. He's checking for other expansions because he realizes that he's probably about to win. Maybe gonna expand here. Just lots and lots and lots of vultures, man. Lovely. Just lovely. I love look at this. just two. This is this is classic composed play. You just have barely enough hitting the thing you need and everything else is in a good position. You know it's a big newbie mistake? Getting every single tank here and being like, I'm going to siege here so I can shoot everything. No, you just need just these two. This is so annoying. He needs to move this engineering bay forward because he can't see anything. Here we go. Oh my god. Oh god. I think there was a reaver drop here, or at least something attempted. Look at this, he just has one tank at the front, that's it. Can't even send anything down the ramp. GG! Just, that's, that's just incredible, that's, that is incredible. That is incredible, okay. I think that is... I think that's incredible. Um, so fantasy in... Hello, young Padawan. Yes, let's learn. Let's learn StarCraft with a little cat on our on our back. There you go, Sheriff. Sheriff, you're gonna need to lie down. Sheriff, I want to talk about Fantasy vs. Stork. Are you gonna lie down?
Yeah, okay, there we go. Now we're relaxed. Now we're relaxed. Young Catawan. Ah, I should I should have gotten that joke right away. So at this point, Stork still leads two to one, but I want to note how just mentally impressive that is that Fantasy still goes for such an incredibly aggressive, yeah, stretch it out, such an incredibly aggressive timing and such an incredibly aggressive play style when everything's on the line. The next map is, I, I don't know how else to put this to you. You'll never play on this map. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know anything about it. But it's important for the sake of history. In the on game at Star League, they regularly rotated maps. Yeah, just close your eyes. Close your eyes and listen to the StarCraft. That's such a good cat. You're so good. You're so Gosu. You're such a Gosu cat. Yeah. So in the on game at Star League, there would often be maps that would stay for several seasons because they were just solid, neutral maps, like Fighting Spirit. Neutral in that it didn't really seem like any one race had a big advantage. A lot of the games that played out tended to be larger macro games without weird terrain formations. Then there would be some maps that would last for, say, two seasons or so that would be maybe a little bit different than that, maybe a little bit backed off. Um, Medusa is, is an example of one that stayed for quite some time. Um, struggling to think of any one that's kind of like in the middle zone. But here is another thing that OGN would do. They would make an insane map every season just to push the envelope of what was strategically possible. So this map is called Plasma. And Plasma's just, it's just, it's weird. Everything about it's weird, okay? Here's your main base, okay? There's three bases. One in the top left corner, one in the bottom left corner, and one just here on the right. What? Okay, I have no, I like, the one at the right has two very clearly different attack angles to it that the top left and top, or bottom left don't have. I mean, it's, this whole map is weird, but it's not even nearly weird enough, so I need to tell you more. So first of all, your main base is so small you can't fit all the buildings that you need on it. You can't fit all the buildings you need on the map, so you have to go to the low ground. You do have a ramp that is unbelievably tiny, like... Units can barely fit up and down this. This is one of the hardest chokes in the entire game. Here is a mineral only map here, or a uh, mineral only expansion. If you go out and loop de loop around, you have a gas expansion, okay? Here's what's really weird. These are eggs. These are neutral eggs that never hatch. Neutral eggs that never hatch. So you need to get powerful enough units to kill the eggs. Because remember, eggs have 10 armor. I feel so I feel so insane. I feel like I feel like I'm trying to get you caught up quickly on Dragon Ball Z if you've never seen an episode. Like it's going to it just trust me, okay? These in essence are barriers that have high armor, so you need significant firepower to break through this barrier. Or break through this what is a 7 by 5 egg wall here in order to get access to here. So if you can get access to this weird centerish region by blowing these eggs apart, by blowing these walls apart, you can get access to more teensy tiny high ground expansions that basically have absolutely no um, good way to defend it. I mean, you can just like, you like put a tank here and it shoots this. I think even a ranged dragoon down here might be able to shoot this. I mean, this is like so weird. Uh, another thing that's really funny, the engine did not support ramps going top left to bottom right so every all ramps in the map have to point down they have to point down so this thing has to hook around so you get this weird like dead chicken shape here with a with a little stick ramp coming off it it's, it's just odd that said the tactical potential in this map is crazy first of all what do you do strategically you're basically on an island there's a wall there's a wall there's a wall you're basically on an island your main base is extremely harassable by air and drops. All of your expansions are spread out. All expansions on the map are extremely harassable by air and drops. And although this... She's shifting her weight. Although... Ah, ah, oh, ow, goodbye, Sheriff. Although this map is weird at first glance, I've kind of told you most of the significant features of it. 
There's one that I forgot that won't even come into play here, so I'm just sharing this for the sake of sharing it. This thin wall, there's a lot of maps that have thin walls that block ground movement, but you can have lots of tanks shooting down here, or you can ferry drops across these very easily. Now you might be asking, why are there minerals here? It's so you can scout with a worker, because if you have a worker and you right click on a mineral, it passes through the eggs. You know how when workers are mining in StarCraft, they pass through each other when they're mining, but if they're not mining, they have collision? The way the engine works is if you right click on a mineral, the worker loses collision. That's, that's the code. I didn't write the code, but that's the code. That's what's in there. So that's how you scout. So that's, that's a little weird. That's a little weird. Listen, listen, listen. The point of this entire series is to catch you up to speed with all this. So you're kind of being hit with a lot here. At the very least, I want you to appreciate the nuance that is happening at sort of like a five mile high level in a lot of these games. So what I want to do is I want to load up game four between these two, because this game was excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, if you think you haven't seen Sick Tactics, don't worry. That's going to be this game. Okay, so tactically, there's a lot of potential here. But strategically, how does this map work? I'm actually going to do something a little different for just this one game. Just to treat you to the logic of figuring out a build order on your own. Okay? Pylon goes down. Here is the... Egg scouting trick. See, he goes here. He sees the mineral field so he can pass through it. So this is just a normal scout. This is just a normal scout. And why is there a scout coming out from our dear friend Stork? Because he is going to go Nexus first. And where is he going Nexus first? He's doing it at the more valuable gas expansion that has seven minerals at it. I believe this also has seven, no, oh, it only has six minerals at it. Yeah, so a little more minerals, a little more gas. Okay. All right, all right, pro gamers. Let me get to the appropriate zoom level. You have your main base, you have this base. We got a problem, don't we? We got a problem. Do you see the problem? What is the most basic problem that we see here? Just think, what is the big problem? Because the details in StarCraft are very nuanced, very complex, but the basic strategy, dead simple. Almost always, it's like, oh, oh. It is a long distance to walk from the main to the expansion. There you go. It's just distance, there's just, just a long distance between them. So, oh man, because if, if I put some Dragoons here to defend from a drop, if I start to see vultures here, maybe they haven't even attacked yet. Maybe they're just heading here. What am I going to do? Send all of them out and down, bumbling all the way up to here? It's a long distance via ground. But it's a short distance via air. All right? Simple statements. So what is our Protoss hero going to do against our Terran hero? All players are heroes uh, in this game, by the way. There are no villains. Everyone's just awesome. Except Savior, he can go die. Um, oh, by the way, this is really cute. He is going to use this Nexus as a next pylon. He had to cut a probe at a certain point in time to make that happen, but now he just doesn't have to build a pylon. Nice. By the way, it's walled off, so no clue what this Protoss player is, or no clue what this Terran player is doing. But we're going to see Stork go for a Reaver. All right, here's the Dragoon coming out, and he's just going to go for a Reaver right away here. Boom. Because if you have a Reaver out, you can drop and defend here and drop and defend here. Now, we are going to rewind the game two minutes, and we're going to go back to full vision mode. Fantasy the Tactical Genius versus Sturdy Stork. Fantasy, unsurprisingly, is just getting a single Marine to repel any sort of scout and is getting a factory and we also see that fantasy is sending an scv scout out now 
Often weird early game tactics are more possible on two player maps, three player maps, because there's less starting positions. You want to do some bullshit? Well, you have reduced the number of bullshit places your opponent can be. Really common one, if there's a map that has three starting locations and you're starting up here, you build something in between these two bases. You don't know if it's the top, you don't know if it's the bottom, but because you built between, it's the same distance between the two. Cheesing works! So, we can see some uh, shenanigans on two and three player maps. So, he scouted, and you'll notice that there's this barracks moving down. Now, we're on an island map. We're on an island map, basically, because all units are walled off by these Zerg eggs. This is still the funniest, weirdest icon to me. So why the hell would Fantasy build a Vulture as his very first thing? Alright, I'm not going to tell you the answer. I see Supernova Maniac in chat. Supernova Maniac is just amazing. Great streamer, great figure in the Brood War community. Known Supernova Maniac for a long time. Super, Supernova Maniac knows exactly what's up. Why build this Vulture first? Well, this is some high-level shit right here, okay? This is just... Don't do this. If you're starting off, don't do this. Don't even, don't even worry about it, okay? Just, here we go. Are you ready? Okay, are you ready? If you begin the landing sequence for the barracks, and it lands on a friendly unit, it will force the friendly unit off its position regardless of what is around. It will force this vulture away from being underneath it. And by forcing the vulture onto another object, each of these objects is also forcing the vulture to get off it, okay? So he gets the vulture through, okay? All right? <laughs> this is fucking great. It's great. I'm out of coffee. I gotta drink water. Okay. Now, you might say, that's... Oh my god, that's so dumb. That's so ridiculous. I want to note a few things after this delicious water. Ah, drinking water is good and healthy for you. I encourage you to do it. This is very impractical. Like, I, I mean, I was doing this at a low speed. Like, this is unreliable. Where's the Vulture? Come on, Mr. Vulture Man. This is unreliable. This takes a shitload of time. You have to be spam clicking the entire time that you're fantasy. You have to go click, 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 click. Because it's a combination of move commands and um, the game trying to push the Vulture off commands. If you wanted to try to push an army through, you would wind up with, like, let's say you had four vultures. One might be here, one might be here, one might be here, one might still stay stuck for a little while longer. You put one dragoon here, you just kill it. Now, this is clearly exploitation of a glitch, but anyone who, who plays enough Brood War knows that it's a glitch. They just know that this is a glitch. And so you prepare for it. This is the most threatening thing that can happen, and what do you know, lo and behold, Stork is already prepared for it. He just calmly retreats, leaves his out there. Brilliant. Back in the main base, we're seeing Fantasy go for massive Vulture plays. Just super, super Vulture focused. Because again, it's an island map. So if I'm Terran, I don't need to worry about tanks very much. Now this is very cute. Fantasy literally runs the entire way around the base. Because if he goes back, he's going to hit the Dragoons. So there's no reason, man. He may as well just go all the way around this way. He's just trying to get a sense of what's up. Still has a scouting SCV. Because there is so much going on in a game of StarCraft, he misses the free kill. Remember, if you ever feel like you're messing something up, you're actually doing great. Happens to pros all the time. In the main base... This add-on just completed, and so we will be seeing it start right when it's at 100 minerals. I want to once again just give so much respect to Fantasy's unbelievably precise build timings. Not only did he precisely get a Vulture in with a Barracks, but he also has 
the exact amount of money to make sure these vultures are producing, to make sure mines is recharging, to make sure ion thrusters, which is the speed upgrade for vultures, to make sure that drop ships are under production. And look at his money. It's like exactly zero. And oh my gosh, he is, is he supply blocked? Nope, this is right around the corner and we'll be ready to go in a second. Smartly cutting some SCVs just to keep the pace and momentum of this up. So our hero vulture has not really been a hero. He's actually just been a totally mediocre um, pleb. Actually, no, that was fucking amazing. Holy cow. Kill him! No, he misses it. Because Stork is going right now for Reavers, the way that he can defend all these different possible angles, because he's going for that, he has not yet gotten range, we expect everything to be delayed for a Protoss player who went for a really fast expansion. Okay, so here is the moment. The drop is coming. Where do you drop if you're fantasy? Do you go for the main? Do you go for the expansion? Which one do you go for? Well, you could, you even have the option of dropping here and then running up with vultures. You have that option. Which one would you do? There's a few things that um, fantasy does here that I would not have done. And this is part of the reason why I would not have done this because I wouldn't even have even seen this potential. You know, APM Jesus in chat says, does it matter? That That's kind of my position, right? Like if I'm doing this, you these are the units that you have shouldn't really matter that much and what i would be looking to do is preserve the life of the dropship if i were here i would i would absolutely do this and the second thing i would think is drop wherever's closest so we get this attack underway instead this barracks remember about tactical planning this terran barracks has been floating here for ages just to make sure that the dropship can go into the main base and suddenly it makes so much sense Oh my god, of course. There's no space in the main base to retreat from mines. Oh, of course. Because one StarCraft map every four years gives you a base where one gateway takes up 10% of the landmass. No StarCraft maps give you these tiny, anemic, small little bases. This is the smallest base. So of course mines are going to be strong here. And this barracks, remember, it's not just that he set the dropship, it's that Fantasy, excuse me, it's not just that Fantasy dropped vultures in the main, it's that he prepared for it, getting vision with the barracks. There, there's actually not good retreating pads, and this mine, there's a little bit of micro, that you can do there picks off one but again there's just no space the dragoon can't pull back and suddenly we see these dragoons these dragoons were being one aid back to the base and the barracks is absorbing the shot stork was focused on the main base and then eventually notices oh shit i need i didn't send these things over and as these vultures are just ripping everything to shreds and now we get a reaver out. <laughs> and it's down to 50 health. And Stork just begins to slowly fall apart. Now, this sort of drop that we see here from Fantasy, this is the expected drop. During this season of the OSL, there were a lot of Terran players, uh, both in practice and in some tournament games, who, who did this. They would drop a little bit out of vision, and then run to the expansions. Why? Because vultures pop out of darkness really quickly. So, ha, I got the element of surprise. Fantasy's one of the few players that just went all into the main. And see, now we, we can see part of Stork's planning. You can see part of the great defense that Stork's going to be able to pull off with these reavers. That You can just walk over here, walk over there. These vultures kind of suck now. They kind of don't do anything anymore now. That is one of the reasons why Stork did this style of build. But look at this. Look at this. This is this is amazing. This continues to be amazing. Terran's building not one but two wraiths. He's building wraiths, man. 
Wraiths are bad. Bad units against Protoss. They're bad. They're so bad. They're bad. They're bad. But they are the thing that exploits the one real weakness of Reaver Defense. Right? The one real weakness of Reaver Defense, which is the shuttle. So suddenly these two tanks... These two tanks should be easily killed. But now there is a clock put on the Reaver. There's going to be a clock put on the shuttle. It's going to die. So the shuttle goes down. Just sieges right back up again. Ferries in more vultures. I think there's even still one alive in the main base. And there's GG. Stork leaves, so the series gets tied up. 2-2. Two to two. That Terran music, though. Oh, my God. Uh, how are we doing on time? We're doing great. We're doing great. Um, last game's coming up. One of the reasons Wraiths stink is that they have 120 health, which might sound like a lot, but they take full damage from Dragoons that deal 20 damage. Therefore, six shots from a Dragoon kill a Wraith. Marines have 40 health and take half damage from Dragoons. So, Dragoons take four hits to kill a Marine. So Wraiths are only a little bit more survivable than Marines against Dragoons. Wraiths also deal damage way slower than Marines. So Wraiths are generally not so good, but wow. Wow, what, 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 what just a nicely constructed tactic. The barracks land into the barracks scout to do the drop. The barracks that blocked the Dragoons from getting into the main base. Then the tank drop followed up by Wraiths. I mean, this is just really awesome. Um, yeah, I just, I think it's lovely. I think it's great. We are now going to go into the final game. And before we go into the final game, I want to just make a statement right now that I hope you've been picking up over time. We've basically been seeing Zealots, Dragoons, Vultures, Tanks, and that is about it. A Reaver's made a cameo here and there. Shuttle's made a cameo. In one game we saw the Templars pretty much just been those units and look at the beautiful diversity not just in terms of possible or possible inputs there's so many different openings you can do with this small set of units but there's also so many different outcomes that can happen in each fight that i think makes it a real treat to watch as we're going into our very last game boom i'm going to come back over to here we are back on sin chapong Ryong. this is one of, we're about to see one of the most famous games in the history of starcraft one this is a truly famous game. Uh, it's not going to be a rush. It's not going to be a rush. So we saw on this game, or on this map, just to um, restate, we have this expansion here. But it's hard to get an additional base. Hard to get this additional base. Hard to even think about these little skimpy ones here. Hard to get these ones at the side. There's a lot of weird, incredibly narrow paths around the side but right here in the middle this is the most important area of the map because again if i'm teal and i'm up in the top right if you control this i'm fighting uphill into you and this controls all of the space on the bottom half of the map you only need to have like one observer here to see any sort of counterattack. so if you control this the only thing you ever need to worry about is this top left expansion which god it feels exposed God, it feels so exposed if you control this. So controlling this, controlling this are the two most important aspects of this entire map. We're about to see the most famous probe in StarCraft. The most famous probe. It's totally me saying, I don't know if it's the most famous probe, but I, I, I would call it the most famous probe in the history of StarCraft. Okay. Let's recap some of the preparations we've seen out of Stork. In game two and three, he did Zealot openings that led into a standard Dragoon and another one that led into a Reaver. We also saw a, um, a weird game on Plasma, which was the game we just watched, which, you know, whatever. But remember the very first game on this map? Stork sent a very early probe to build a pylon right here and build a gateway and similarly he could build a pylon gateway right here 
This is now the most famous probe. Look in the main base of Stork. Pylon. Going down. What's up? What's happening? The most famous probe. Okay. Yeah. Alright. Most famous probe. This probe, up to this moment, has been sent in a move path to the enemy base. Nothing extraordinary. But this. This is extraordinary. Cuts all the way to the left. Why? Look at the map. There's nothing here. There's nothing over here. There's nothing at all on this side. He could have gone from here and gone straight down. Now, follow my mouse very carefully. Alright, this is the path that it would have taken. It would have gone down, and it would have gone over, and then it would have gone left. This is very important that you understand. Look at him. The probe is hooking all the way to the left side. Okay? All the way to the left side. Right here. Fantasy sees this probe. That is the moment. That is the moment. Why? In game one, there was a proxy pylon and a gateway, and that killed fantasy. No normal probe would come from, from this side. There's nothing over here. There's nothing over here. Normal probes would come down here and then hook in here. This telegraphs to fantasy, I am proxying you. A very common proxy spot was to build a, a pylon and a gateway here and then come down this way. Now, what you're going to see is, is going like for the next five seconds, is going to seem uneventful, right? We're gonna we're gonna select the money of fantasy. He has an SCV queued up. He tries to block. The probe gets in. Remember how I talked about how important formations are. Where if you build a barracks here, Marines can get through, but Zealots can't. Great. The probe appears to be trying to block this. It appears to be trying to block this, right? It appears to be trying to block this. And if you're fantasy, you're going, shit, 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 I don't want to lose the Zealots. I don't want to lose the Zealots. So you have to, you absolutely have to save your money to build this barracks. And with all that, Stork steals his gas. Okay? <laughs> with all that, Stork gets the guaranteed gas steal. If I actually just back up a few seconds again. Now suppose you are not playing against... Suppose you, you don't have any reason to believe that he is going to proxy you. Suppose you're just playing a standard old basic ass game of StarCraft. You get in here and you go, oh, are you going to try to gas steal me? Oh, fuck you. You know what you do? You build a refinery. You remove the SCV from the refinery, and then you return to normal. And in this way, you deny the gas block. You don't waste any um, time completing it and mining gas. And then you build your barracks a little late, which is fine. But with this play, Stork forces fantasy to build this barracks. Fantasy could not have even afforded to build the refinery. Excuse me. He could have not have afforded to build the assimilator because he only has 44. The most famous probe. So this entire sequence of movements with this probe, why it was sent so early, why it moved on all these funny angles was just to force fantasy to not build a refinery on top of this assimilator. You know what I said last game? Two player and three player maps are where you can get away with interesting opening tactics or shenanigans or bullshit. This is the most famous probe. Now the funny, funniest thing is that oh he see mines his gas oh what an appalling monster stork oh my god look at that face look at that little smirk that's the smirk on the left of a Protoss who just stole gas from an assimilator he built in your base oh what an animal <laughs> okay 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 brutal savage wrecked you know what's really dirty 
you can mine minerals and it replaces the gas with minerals and then you can get in there and you can mine again. Ugh. Oh god, just ask Bisu about his game burst flash on Monty Hall. Oh, that's for another day, oh my god. So, what we're going to see out of um, Stork is going to be some pretty standard stuff, so I'm going to return to this in a moment. So, what, what do you do as Terran? Interestingly enough, opening up without a gas and just building a command center right away is one of the more common Terran openings. You just go barracks, bunker, command center, and fully intend on repairing that bunker a shitload. So we see the command center going down. Fantasy is basically playing um, fine. He's going to be building factories down here as normal. And in the meantime, we see Stork doing... Uh, you may recognize this opening. He has one zealot. He has a dragoon. He's just checking around. And this game is going to turn into a real game. Everyone lost their damn minds when that initial block happened. So Stork is waiting for range to finish. Why? Well, if I gas blocked you, and then you responded by expanding, I know that your tanks are delayed. So I can be very aggressive with Dragoons early on and know that there's not going to be any tanks. This is relatively uh, normal opening styles. Nexus! Hey, hey, who likes one gate with range? Nexus plays. I certainly do. And then we see Stork actually setting up to get a third Nexus. Why? Well, if you don't have tanks, I can pressure you with Dragoons. So you have to get tanks. You might even have to get Siege Mode first. And if you're getting tanks with Siege Mode, you're going to be real bad at attacking expansions. That said, if you are fantasy, you are you are thinking to yourself, well, hey, I actually have a pretty good economy right now. I feel pretty okay economically right now. Uh-oh. Seriously, that is... I don't even give that enough room to breathe there. This is a common thing that will happen if you do these types of things. Like, if you are a new player, don't do this as Terran. Don't do low ground command center with a bunker waiting for a delayed tank to save you, because if you're against good players, they'll spot that your tank is not too far forward, not too far forward, and too far forward. And there's the shot. Tries to hit. One incorrect movement command, and it's gone. Just exploiting these little edges. Meanwhile, Stork, double expand. Boom. Boom. Gets Robo. Gets Gateway. Yeah. But these areas are very, very tight, very hard to break through, so. What was the net effect? Well, we see that Fantasy is has been so spooked by Dark Templar drop, by Reaver drop, by proxies, that by the end of this game, look at him, defensive barracks landed at the back, academy with comsat, turrets ringing the base. How many factories did Fantasy have in a lot of these games? He went for three pretty fast, and then five pretty fast. This is not a bad style of play. I want to stress, this is not, like, Fantasy is not being an idiot by any means. But he sure doesn't look like Fantasy in this game. He is cloistered, holed up in his own little cave. And it is the accumulation of different styles coming out of Stork that have pierced and poked at Fantasy's... Uh, you know, mental fortitude throughout the series, with that final most famous probe getting the gas steal. He's spooked, man. Spooky probe. I gotta get a probe emote, man. I gotta do that. Now he's getting ion thrusters. Um, and the thing that made Flash really famous is Flash popularized going, yep. I don't have any way to deal pressure to you, armory, armory, mass upgrades, prepare for third. What third? What third do you prepare for on this map? This one? That you have to defend by, like, going all the way out and over? Or all the way uphill through a small choke and then down and around? It's basically this one, but this is, this is, 
tricky and shitty to defend. The most reasonable third for Terran, I actually think, is this one. Because you can push up to here, move up this way, and that's how you secure this. But, I mean, even then, it's not really a good place to go. So, stylistically, it's hard to do that flash, large push with upgrades style. By the way, for any of you who don't know, always build pylons to wall off places where vultures might be. What about drops? Yeah, what about him? He can't both build turrets and an academy and tanks to defend this push and then be getting ready to drop. It's just not going to be a concern for another few minutes. He has a pile on there spot anyways. <laughs> These poor vultures are just like, anything, anything, oh god. Now on maps that have more expansions... Protoss would be gearing up to go for Arbiters along with a fourth. Terran would be gearing up to, um, you know, take a third, maybe a fourth himself. It just doesn't work that way on this map. There's just not that many good bases. And so this is going to lead to a very tense and significant fight that's going to happen in a moment. By the way, remember the glitch where the factory was able to land and pop the Vulture through? That's what Fantasy's trying to do with this mine. Plant a mine to pop the Vulture through. Which would have been okay. It wouldn't have been devastating. It would have been okay. You lose maybe three, four probes. All the probes right-click over here. Dragoons show up. See, these narrow corridors are... There's a lot of them, but if you get stuck, you just you instantly die. So anyways, this is a very tense period as Protoss, where you need to make absolutely certain that you're macroing well, and that you are macroing properly. And by properly, I mean... Stork is building up a lot of Dragoons. Here's a good chunk of Dragoons. Here's another good chunk of Dragoons. Uh, they're, they're a little bit spread out, but there's enough. You want to have enough Dragoons to pick off the mines, and they're sort of the core of your army. But once you have that core set up, it's only Zealots. It's like massive, massive, massive numbers of Zealots. And if you overbuild Dragoons, or, uh, hell, even underbuild Dragoons, you wind up losing these fights in a really stupid way. So Fantasy, starting to look like Fantasy again. He's moving out to the middle of the map just to hold it. Because this spoke here, or not spoke, this um, um, this pod, this high ground pod here, this high ground pod here. Two most important locations in the game. Something that kind of stinks, if you are Terran... You don't want to push forward over your own mines. Because, obviously, a zealot will come in, blow up, and you'll lose everything. So what you kind of have to do is plant mines. And then walk forward, plant some mines, and then shoot and kill your own mines. Which is a very common technique. It's important to do. But you don't want to just only be planting and killing your own mines. It kind of hurts the core essence of the vulture. You kind of want to have a minefield on a flank and have just a few mines pushing forward. So we see continued hugging of the wall, just hugging this as much as possible. Turrets advancing forward, and we see, once again, Stork doing his usual very careful playing with Dragoons. He's trying to find little angles. So this is, this is, just, this is just pure macro, right? Six factory... Versus 10 gateways, 9 gateways, should 9 feels about right, yeah. 9 gateways on 3 base, especially if you haven't been mining very much gas. Haven't been mining very much gas. So it's 156 supply to 109 supply. I want to just take a moment to note how impressive Stork's vision is. He has carefully moved every single one of his observers, his shuttle... More observers, all of his units, and he knows exactly where every single thing is. And he's looking for the weak spot, and this is the weak spot for the shuttle. No shuttle can come in from this side. Shuttles coming in from this side are going to have a rough time because all the vultures are here. This is the weak point. So here it is, the swarm of zealots. Just count the dragoons. 14, 15, 
got built up in high numbers at the start, and now they're just being rallied in. And these ones at the back. Vultures come back to deal with these. No vultures at the front. It allows the zealots to get massive surface area. And of course the dragoons stepping forward to intelligently target fire the tanks. Lots of little target firing, little maneuvers, and suddenly Stork breaks through and now Stork has control of his opponent's high ground pod. And, I mean, you'll feel this when you start to sit down and play. You might look at that and go, oh, he just built a bunch of zealots and dragoons and sent them in. Super no. Anyone who's played a lot of uh, StarCraft Remastered or Brood War knows units are going all over the place. Zealots can come in all on one side. The dragoons can come in all on one side. There was a nice spread. The dragoons can get stuck target firing turrets when you want them to step forward and pick off the tanks. The shuttle at the back needs to also be simultaneously controlled. You need to judge where the vultures are and shift your dragoons over in an angle in order to do that. And none of this happens unless also strategically you have been planning out when to start flooding with zealots and macroing well enough in order to do that. This is like the culmination of a lot of tense and difficult decision making for Stork. And Fantasy, unfortunately, is getting pushed back quite a lot. This is what stinks about trying to push up high ground. This is what really is very painful. Once you lose tanks, you have to stop and rebuild. Typically what happens is you'll wind up getting like 10 tanks get into attack, lose all of your vultures, but only two of your tanks. So the next fight, you have like 18 tanks. You lose all of your vultures, but most of your tanks stay alive. So in the next fight, you have like 22 tanks. But once your tank count gets sufficiently low again, you're in bad shape. Now what is Stork doing here? Because Stork also does not have a very comfortable fourth base, ideally, if you're Protoss, you just want to take a fourth. You just want more bases, but they're also unsafe. Again, classic Stork, he says, well, I'll do the second best thing, which is I'll get assimilators at all three of my expansions, and I'll start doing things with gas units. I'll start getting Storm with High Templar. Strictly better to get more minerals and more gateways, but if you're in a bind and you just want a tiny edge, you know, get your gas-based units. So this is a, this is a little over-eager by Stork. He's going to pull back in a moment here, but this is, this is a great moment where you can just throw the game by trying to push into this very fortified Terran position. I mean, two tanks on high ground is fortified. It's not just rallying. Carefully trying to actually do uh, pickoffs here. But the vultures up here from Fantasy, just incredible focus. Just great wherewithal to be able to find this. But does he have the time to remember it because he's getting his front busted in? The shuttle did die. But, I mean, Ter Terran units are just so good. Terran units are way better than Protoss units. It's just that Protoss can expand so much and get so many of them. So little edges. This was the big hope, is that could Fantasy have this hidden expansion stay hidden for long enough? So I'll sort of describe this expansion as hidden in plain sight. If you're Stork, you just, you have vision of like the whole map. It's just barely not in vision range. Like so barely. It's just such a good job by Fantasy to like find the time to do this. Classic Fantasy. Oh, also. <laughs> I didn't even see that the last time I watched this game. So once again, nothing too fancy. Just lots of basic macro on the backside. Expanding to this. Having Dragoons lead everything. Having Zealots accumulated in the back. Some Vultures trying to do some stuff, but with these little pylon walls everywhere. Stork is just reducing possible ways that Fantasy can win here. Possible ways Fantasy can win there. Fantasy's trying to hunt for more windows of opportunity, but there's just so few areas that you actually need to manage in order to keep all this stuff alive. 
I mean, fantasy's really good at finding paths in order to get in there. But let's not forget, high ground control. Fantasy needs a lot of tanks. So it's 95 supply to 135. This is very common. It is extremely normal for Protoss to be way ahead of Terran in supply. That indicates typically a relatively even match rather than a Protoss dominated one. Okay, so the harassment from all different angles successfully let Fantasy begin to plant mines up here. This is very, very big. This is the sort of tactical move that could let Fantasy back into the game. And you can see it from Stork. Stork had a few units running around in different angles, and now all of a sudden they're just kind of sitting, not doing that much in the middle. And these vultures are actually getting kind of free reign to move forward here. I mean, when I was watching this, I watched every single OSL Finals live from 2003 to 2009. Every single one I watched. Uh, excuse me, I watched every single one. I watched almost every single one live. There were like two or three that I missed. Because I fell asleep like a normal adult. And at this moment, I was like, oh my god, is Fantasy actually going to do this? It's 120 supply versus 150 supply. And why am I saying that? Because, whoa, all these little weird vulture tactics are suddenly giving access to the most important place in the whole map, which is this high ground pod. And, I mean, Terran is getting a little bit clogged up in the base because he's microing so much everywhere else. That doesn't take very much effort to undo. But, I mean, this is so annoying. These vultures are so annoying. There's an Arbiter being made, but remember, this is not the 4, 5, 6 base Protoss of modern day, right? This is, this is kind of a scrappy situation for Protoss. Certainly a very scrappy situation for Terran, who's running out of minerals at his expansion and his main. But during this time, Fantasy didn't move forward. He didn't move forward. And right when it looked like he was maybe going to have some hope, he was still getting some minerals here. So it isn't a lot, but this is still big. The most painful mistake happens. And this is not a mistake that I'm calling a mistake because, oh, it's so easy to not do. But this is the sort of thing that it is the difference between making the comeback in the huge championship when you've been down 0-2 versus just losing it, All right? There were so many opportunities for Fantasy to get it in this game. But in this moment, he's pushing forward, Stork rushes forward, and Fantasy sieges too late. Watch when he sieges. Notice how there's no mines up here. He needed to plant mines and then plant more mines and have his tanks already here. There's no mines. He was spending so much time microing with the vultures. This is the first opportunity that these siege tanks are ever going to have to fire. Just a few high Templar in a scrappy game. You'd want the extra gateway units, but what do you know? He's just rolling through everything. And this, by all measures, is pretty close. You can imagine these Dragoons versus an extra volley from 15 tanks, and it's a different game. And you want to feel bad for Fantasy, but don't, man. That guy's won so much stuff. He's great. Stork's great, too. Stork, Stork needed to win. This was his first gold in the OSL after getting a bunch of seconds. These guys were big rivals, too. Wound up in the finals of OSL a ton in 2008-9. Fantasy's still mining. Hang in there. But hip hip. 1A. Oh, glorious, beautiful, excellent, fantastic, nifty, great. And that's GG. The Stork became an OSL champion, the most coveted title in all of Brood War. And with that, that is going to end our very first episode of Let's Learn StarCraft. We did the introduction, episode zero, beforehand. And this one, we actually took a look at a finals match between two incredible players and there was just so much glory that was going to be there and we got to see it 
<sighs> and I'll reiterate that for the next several months, every Tuesday and Thursday at 5 p.m., we're going to be doing videos about strategy, mechanics, mindset, and analyzing great games. And I'm going to make sure I give you some homework assignments of what to play and how to play it in order to make sure that you're getting into Brood War and you're having a blast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hope you have a great night, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching.